begin this conversation, because this is a conversation, this is not a lecture, uh, so I, I hope you will all generate questions in the first 15 minutes of my monologue. Uh, by answering the question, what is this deadline about, where does it come from, and what are the political and technical factors that are influencing uh, whether a deal is reached on Monday, which is the deadline that we are up against. So this really has its roots in the inauguration of Iran's President Rouhani on August 3rd of 2013, which marked a shift uh, in the political uh, structure of the Iranian executive that allowed them to uh, essentially engage with the West. It was sort of uh, probably preceded by secret negotiations between the U.S. and Iran, where essentially the idea behind what each side was after was articulated. And with Rouhani, we saw uh, the replacement of Ahmadinejad uh, with a guy who understood uh, the United States and the constraints and was less conservative and more open to negotiation. But more importantly, we saw a change in who ran the negotiations from a guy named Jalili at the Supreme National Security Council to a, the new foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who had spent his uh, previous uh, appointment as the ambassador to the United Nations in New York and spent years and years between the 2002 revelation of the program and his final departure becoming schooled and steeped in nuclear issues by American academics who would visit him in New York and basically educate this guy about what proliferation concerns were, why we care about centrifuges, how we deal with uh, non-proliferation. And he, this guy is now in charge of the negotiations. So starting in August, uh, they began talking, and on November one year ago, November 24th, a, an agreement was reached to essentially thaw the political climate and freeze the escalation. That was called uh, the Joint JPA, Joint uh, Plan of Action, thank you, Joint JPOA, JPOA, Joint Plan of Action, in which essentially uh, Iran agreed not to install any more centrifuges, not, and to convert some of its LEU into uh, a form that cannot be readily further enriched, and I'll talk about why that's important in, in a moment. And the United States basically said, okay, we're not going to escalate on sanctions, and this stabilized the situation so they could now have serious discussions. <coughs> so here we are, one year later, the, this uh, joint plan of action has been extended once in July, and still we don't have a deal. And I, I'm sorry to say that there is virtually no chance that a deal will happen by Monday. But that's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, so the most recent uh, meeting between, at the high level was uh, in Muscat, in Oman, between uh, Zarif, the Iranian negotiator, or foreign minister, uh, John Kerry, and Kathy Ashton, who heads EU foreign policy. And that was a very rumor has it, unproductive meeting. Uh, they did not come to an agreement, but everyone walked away from that meeting with an understanding that they do want an agreement and they're not going to let this framework fall apart. Uh, it's not that So the issues that remain outstanding are the size of the stockpile of LEU, the duration of any terms that apply to Iran, how many years they have to abide by exceptional inspection provisions and restraints on their nuclear program, and exactly how many centrifuges Iran will have. So these are the biggest and most important factors in the deal. And the fact that these are not yet agreed upon is in principle worrisome, but also not surprising, because these are the factors that you expect all sides to sort of run to the deadline in a, a kind of a brinkmanship arrangement where they attempt to get, get, play a game of chicken to get the best deal that they possibly can. But even if suddenly on Sunday night there's a phone call to Obama and he says, okay, here's the deal, we're going to re concede to your uh, request, it, there still will not be a final arrangement because there are many, many issues in the details that remain to be worked out. These include uh, how will centrifuges coming offline be disabled, how will they be verified, what access will the IAEA have, 
what kind of R&D will be allowed in what locations. For example, it is, it is agreed that Fordow, one of the enrichment sites, will become an R&D site. And people say, yeah, we, we figured that out, it's agreed. But there's still not agreement on whether that R&D can include research on centrifuges or it must be something about something else. So there are a lot of details that have to be worked out at the technical level. And there are actually technical discussions that started last night in Vienna, uh, and I believe going on uh, today. And we will see what comes out. But the short of it is, it's very unlikely that all these issues uh, can be agreed without at least another, I would say, three to six months of uh, detailed talks at the technical level. Now, that doesn't mean we need to wait three to six months until we actually have an arrangement. Some of that can happen afterwards. Uh, that's how the JPOA was worked out. Afterwards, the IEEA was sent in to work out specifics of verification and so forth. So what happens then on Monday? Well, at best, what we get is um, an agreement to, at minimum, we get probably an agreement to at least extend JPOA. No changes. At best, we get some kind of framework that outlines the broad structures of a deal. It may even include numbers on, for example, the limits on centrifuges, if those can be agreed by Monday. The question for the United States right now is whether to sell this once or twice. If they simply extend the arrangement, if they look like they've not been very productive with Iran and come under criticism from the right in the United States. But if they do a provisional framework deal, then they have to sell this to Congress twice, once as a provisional framework, and then once when they finalize all the terms. And it's not clear they want to do such a heavy lift on the political side. So it's unclear exactly what we will get Monday. From Iran's perspective, what we hear in, in, the, uh, in the news is they are basically looking at, they're basically in a similar situation, and they are hoping for agreement, at least in principle, to some broad uh, uh, terms. That was the comments of the Deputy Foreign Minister, actually, who is also the effective uh, head of negotiations. So, uh, you haven't probably heard that we've not been making a lot of progress, even though we haven't been. And the reason for that is essentially the elections, the midterm elections. The U.S. did not want this to be on the table as an election issue. Uh, so, everything was essentially frozen, but now we are uh, post-elections and we're really trying to, to get this going. What might a deal look like if they can agree to something on the 24th? I have no inside information, but there are some sounds and rumbles, and I will sort of uh, report what I think is the most credible uh, uh, rumor uh, that I've heard from uh, high-level U.S. sources. And it's some, probably something like 4,000 centrifuges down from their current almost 10,000 uh, IR1s and a cap on the amount of low enriched uranium at something alike 300 kilograms, a duration of something like 12 years, and agreements to cap the qualitative uh, and uh, quantitative performance of new centrifuge uh, research. For example, limiting the development of new centrifuges to something like 10 times the performance of the current centrifuges, but not beyond that, so that Iran doesn't acquire such a capability that it becomes very difficult to, to manage. Um, <clears throat> we will see uh, what the Vienna talks bring. They may be discussing uh, this exact issue, and maybe there will be something that may be. But here are the constraints that are affecting uh, how these numbers uh, are settled. On the US side, we are essentially the, the decision issue is breakout. The idea that Iran will use its declared nuclear infrastructure to suddenly make a nuclear weapon. And that's how we do the calculus. When I was in government, that's what my job was, to do this calculus and to figure out how long it would take Iran. But what is unusual and interesting about this is that in 2011, there was a national intelligence estimate by a consensus view of every intelligence agency in the US government that if Iran did want a nuclear weapon, it would not do it this way. That it would not use this declared infrastructure, but rather would build a dedicated covert program. So why does this issue become the sort of decision point for the US position? 
and I don't have a good answer beyond it is what is very, it is what is public and what is visible and knowable. Uh, but it does mean that we have some flexibility on the number because we can arguably accept that Iran may be closer on the grounds that, look, if Iran really is going to do this, it's not going to use its, its declared facilities. Uh, but it all comes down to essentially domestic politics and politics with Israel on how well that plays. Um, there could be a, a small, I want to put a footnote here because there could be some uh, exceptions, and that is under certain circumstances, one can see an arrangement of the Iranian nuclear program where the declared facility is the primary concern. For example, if Iran retains a large amount of uranium enriched to approximately 20%, the amount that it has right now, uh, with its declared facilities, it could potentially make a nuclear weapon in something like 11 days. Now, it has agreed, under the Joint Plan of Action, to convert that material into fuel, but so far there has been very little progress on that. So these are a few critical factors that have to be uh, dealt with before we can really say, well, we can live with the existing program in a, in a broad range of capacities. Uh, but these factors do need to be addressed in this framework. Uh, if we do not deal with 20% enrichment, the existing capacity does present uh, a concern. On Iran's side, their constraint, uh, at least publicly, is the desire to have a civil nuclear program. Uh, there was a, a statement just the other day from Iran, uh, I can't quite remember who said it, uh, they said, <clears throat> quote, we can't accept at all to have a decorative caricature of a nuclear industry. And this is the line that they're putting forth, that they really need to have a robust and serious nuclear infrastructure, that the enrichment program is part of that, and that they can't simply compromise uh, and give up that capacity, because this isn't really about civil uh, peaceful purposes. <coughs> well, <coughs> that's well and good. I, I don't believe them. Um, why? For, an, me, why? for a number of reasons, uh, partly because for example, <coughs> 10,000 centrifuges, which is what they're arguing that they can live with for a long time, doesn't constitute a meaningful civilian capability. It provides 10% of the capacity that they would need to support just one power reactor. And they're talking about building many power reactors. So it doesn't even provide uh, an emergency backup capability of any significance if, say, fuel were cut off. Second, there's many better ways of dealing with fuel supply security. For example, uh, they could stockpile uh, LEU, or fabricated fuel, in country. They could stockpile 30 years of fuel, and it would still cost them less than the enrichment program. And that fuel wouldn't be vulnerable to things like technological failures, Stuxnet, earthquakes, uh, all sorts of problems that plague the enrichment uh, program, uh, including, needless to say, the difficult politics that the enrichment program creates. So, there is not really a rational uh, reason, and I, I've had dinner with the foreign minister every year for the last three years, and in the, uh, when it comes to the uh, UN General Assembly. <coughs> and in the last um, meeting I had uh, with Zarif, a few months ago, I, you know, I said this to him, and I said, look, uh, there isn't really a rational argument. And he said, yeah, I, you know, I know this, but we need... We cannot compromise. It's really a, a public relations issue. We need to have an enrichment capability so we are not seen as giving it. I said, okay, fine. Why don't you do something like maintain all your centrifuges, but instead of enriching uranium, enrich molybdenum to produce peaceful medical isotopes. And he sat there and he said, you are too clever. <laughs> and I presented proposal after proposal in ways they could retain their enrichment capability, but at the same time, eliminate the rapid ability to produce nuclear weapons. Every one of those was rejected. So the, the simple willingness not to explore these uh, makes me wonder whether this is really about face saving or whether this is more internally about retaining some minimum but not clearly defined strategic capability for whatever future purpose it might serve. And that's my view, is that, that this is what is really driving the, uh, the decision-making. They, they've made an investment. They see it as strategic. They see it even, even the 
potential of the centrifuge program means something to Israel and to other nations in the West, even if they're not on the brink of making a nuclear bomb. The fact that they can make a nuclear bomb is significant. And they want to retain as much of that investment as possible. And so that's, I think, really a decision point for them. Um, <coughs> yeah. Does the U.S. see that uh, the same way as well, uh, having this uh, potential for uh, nuclear uh, facilities, being capable of, does uh, that put a country in a higher position in political arguments or political situation? I would say probably yes. Uh, maybe not objectively so, but it is perceived to be so. And for that reason alone, that's enough. Uh, as, as an example, uh, the U.S. is currently spending billions of dollars to revive its uh, nuclear weapons fabrication capability. We are not planning to produce any more nuclear weapons. But we argue that we need to do this because the mere existence of that capability provides a kind of strategic, I think my phone is ringing. How do I hang that phone? Uh, that uh, the simple existence of, to, of this capability that can allow us to rapidly increase the size of our already oversized nuclear arsenal is perceived or argued as having um, some kind of strategic value. Now, I think one has to be careful because there is also an institutional interest in getting money for the national labs, building nuclear weapons, and they make these arguments in order to maintain their programs. And the same thing is presumably happening inside Iran. So whether at the end of the day there's any truth to this, it's hard to say, but these arguments are operational inside both governments. Uh, excuse me, I'm against nuclear weapon, but if tomorrow uh, another president comes in the United States and wants to attack Iran, what they should do? Without nuclear weapons. Let's put. Let me put that question on. If hold. you want to attack uh, Iran, such you attack Iraq, without no reason. They didn't attack you, but you attacked them. If United States want to attack Iran, so they have no choice but that. Mm. This is clearly a very important phone call. Uh, I don't think it is likely that. That is a credible scenario. Let's get back to it as soon as I finish my remarks. I have a few more things. Actually, I just want to ask a more relevant question yeah. to your argument. So just for the sake of argument, uh, could you explain, uh, you said uh, some of the arguments you hear from the Iranian side may not be deemed as rational, right? So what is the rationale, you think, behind the Congress <coughs> or, or basically uh, right in the U.S. to uh, basically to negotiate for no capacity, no nothing at all? What is the rationale behind that? I would also argue this is uh, pretty irrational. At least, I want us to use the term rationally carefully because I don't wish to uh, take the position that there is one correct way to think about politics. Politics are driven by a huge range of value structures and how you uh, evaluate something is different. But from a, let's say, technocratic sense, uh, it is also not very logical to argue for zero because they have the capability to make uh, centrifuges. There is a long history of countries doing this in a way which is clandestine capable. So insisting on zero at the risk of getting no deal and at the risk of continued uh, political enmity is buying you almost nothing in terms of actual limitations on their capabilities to make nuclear weapons, but is, but is exacerbating the political situation that might drive them to make nuclear weapons. So I, I do not support it. But let me finish my remarks, and we'll get back to the talk. You going to answer my question? Yeah, I so think let, your question is a little more complicated. Let me it's not in the context of what I'm saying. It's really simple. But let me, let me set the structure for the, for the, for the talk, and then we're going to go forward. So he's going to finish his context, setting the context for us. After that, we're going to start the back and forth in terms of the discussion. So everyone, okay. please hold your question. So, um, okay, so what is going, now, uh, going on now with the, um, uh, the politics of the situation? Uh, Look, Obama uh, made a conscious decision to put off 
any serious negotiations during the entire first term of his presidency. The reason was that Obama didn't want to be seen uh, as uh, weak uh, if he had to be compromising with Iran and risk his re-election, so they basically did nothing. Uh, plus, there was a difficult uh, party in power in Iran, so it didn't really make a lot of sense. But now, Obama sees that the Congress is changing, that the Republicans are coming in, uh, they don't like this, and this may be his last chance. So uh, there is a lot of pressure on the U.S. to come to an agreement uh, soon. Iran, on the other hand, uh, wants very badly to eliminate sanctions. Sanctions have had a significant impact on the economy. Uh, but the promise that sanctions will be lifted is not seen as credible in the eyes of the public. Um, so, for example, let me just give you some public statistics. 94% of Iranians support the nuclear program. 79% support it uh, somewhat, the rest support it strongly. I'm sorry, where are these this statistics from? This statistic comes from the most recent poll done in conjunction with the Tehran Public Opinion Research Center and the uh, University of Maryland SISM program, Center for International I'm Security. The environment of society in Iran. These things cannot be credible because people cannot so express their opinion. Possibly, PIPA, the program at Maryland, is a very well respected <coughs> international polling program. Whether you want to believe it or not, I don't know. But they, it, it is at least run, the poll was run by people who have a long history of taking difficult polls in foreign countries and know what they're doing. So th this is the best statistic I can provide. I can't, I can't say it is true, but this is the best poll data I can get. I'm not questioning the no. US side, I'm talking. Well, it was, a, it was a joint effort, so but I, yeah. Despite, after that, it comes back to people who are able to express their opinion. Objectively. And so, what do they mean by the program, too? Because right, do so they mean weapons, or do they mean? They mean a civil nuclear program. Uh, and, you know, the, a lot of this comes from increased prosperity in Iran over the last decade and a kind of obsession with technology and high-tech that I don't think Americans fully appreciate. I mean, Iran is, is being transformed. As a, Tehran is a place where you have computers at bus stops that tell you, uh, you know, when the next bus is arriving. And these are things that don't exist really anywhere else in the Middle East. They really see themselves as cutting edge, and that really is something we don't appreciate in, in this country. So it's just a, a political issue. 49%, um, according to this poll, whether you can believe it or not, uh, say they support a, an agreement in principle with the United States to end uh, this confrontation. But 74% uh, say they also believe that if a deal is done, the U.S. will not uphold its promise to lift sanctions and that the U.S. will simply find another way to sanction Iran. So that's the situation for the public. Now for the elites, they don't particularly worry about U.S. sanctions so much because what they see is that they can get by if we can lift U.N. sanctions and multilateral sanctions. U.N. sanctions can make things particularly difficult. Uh, still, they can become very draconian, but of for the most part, Iran understands that the Congress will do what it's going to do, and as long as it can start trading with the rest of the world, that's probably okay. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the United States sees a window that is closing if they don't do a deal, where Iran sees the status quo. And so I would argue that really the pressure is on the US at this point to do the deal. Uh, I just want to, to mention uh, another effect uh, which is in play. This has dragged on for so long and the Iranian issue has become uh, such a politicized uh, point and I think elites on both sides really understand that look, Iran can make a nuclear weapon if it really wants to. This is all about domestic politics. That in, in essence, um, this has become a proxy for the broader set of domestic issues between, or, or international relation issues between these two countries. That, you know, whether we do a deal or not is whether, is basically a statement about whether we want to restore relations with Iran. 
And it, it goes back to 1979 and all the enmity between our two countries. But unfortunately, none of those issues are up for discussion. And I just want to highlight some of those issues because I think they're incredibly important and speak to the importance of fin finalizing this deal and moving on. Uh, they include things like dealing with ISIS, Syria, and Iraq. Um, right now, as best as we can understand, there's just very minimum discussion on some of these issues in terms of deconflicting, but there really isn't Iranian cooperation on these other Middle East issues which are, which, for which they could be incredibly useful, uh, including in areas like conventional uh, arms control and so forth. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, stability there, dealing with the drug trade, uh, which is an important issue for Iran, they really care about it. Uh, security in the Persian Gulf generally, oil pipelines uh, going through the region, piracy, human rights, civil rights, military to military uh, relationships to prevent crisis escalation. We have no such thing in place. Energy security, cyber security, this has become a big issue for US and Iran after the Stuxnet attack. <coughs> we really should talk about that. And you know, also all the conventional nuclear uh, arms control issues, CTBT, FMCT, Biological Web Weapons Convention, Chemical Weapons Convention, Middle East Nuclear Weapons Peace Zone. Iran has to participate in all of these things if the Middle East states are going to be secured and join the international community on these important arrangements. And we can't do that unless we have some kind of relationship with Iran. So we really do need to uh, end this enmity and have some kind of rapprochement. And so with that, I will now take your questions. And we do want this to be a discussion, so it doesn't have to be a question, it can definitely be a comment. Um, and we'll start with you, or whoever had a hand up on this side. Can you uh, make some comments about the dynamics between Iran, Russia, China, and almost the rest of the whole <coughs> non-aligned country, and um, the seemingly conflict and friction between the West, Israel, the other alliance, and I will try. Because you mentioned ISIS and Syria and everything else. But right. So at this, at this point, um, I think everyone, for what I said a couple of moments ago, that this is such an old issue and it's become so politicized, that basically all these uh, other players, Russia, China, uh, etc., are, are using this to further their own private agendas. So, for example, I think Russia is... Uh, the cleanest example here. China is a little more complicated. Um, you know, Russia wants to sell arms to Iran. Uh, they were in the business of selling a lot of anti-aircraft and other arms. And uh, for that reason, they want a quick deal. They want a deal that uh, won't constrain their military. They're, and they have been vigilant in making sure that any idea of what a deal might look like does not include, for example, limitations on the purchase of conventional arms. At the same time, now that the price of oil is going down and Iranian <coughs> oil is being kept off the market, they don't really mind if they continue to sell their natural gas and oil at higher prices. And so if they want to drag their feet for a while, the US wants to drag their feet, that's fine with Russia. And if they can use this to get uh, more uh, deals to sell Iranian, Iran nuclear reactors, that's also good. And so, for example, uh, we have seen just a few days ago that Iran and Russia signed an agreement for the purchase of eight nuclear reactors. You have to multiply each one of those times something like $9 billion. I mean, we're talking a lot of money here uh, over the next several decades if these contracts actually uh, come through. And, uh, you know, Iran, uh, Russia says you know, we will provide fuel for the entire lifetime of these reactors. And, that's their contribution to saying, uh, look, we're not exacerbating the claim that Iran needs to enrich. But at the same time, they're exploiting the fact that Iran wants to claim that it has a big civil nuclear program coming down the pike. And so this allows Iran to make this claim. So they're, they're playing the game. And they're, they're taking what profit they can get out of it. Uh, China is a little more complicated. Uh, they use this as a proxy to discuss all sorts of US-Chinese issues. At the end of the day, I think China supports non-proliferation. They do their best uh, to try to limit uh, exports to Iran on proliferation-sensitive technology. 
but they're not going to try too hard. And uh, they're going to use this as frequently and often as they can to reduce US pressure in other areas as quid pro quo for helping out in the negotiations. And so we see this kind of behavior from, uh, from countries. But just to follow up, since we're on the topic, <coughs> there seem, I've heard some rumors in the press that Saudi Arabia said that they can easily acquire uh, from Pakistan nuclear, nuclear weapons. Something like that. This is a very old. It is. So this goes back to the, the fact <coughs> that Saudi Arabia provided some funding, or is believed to have and incredibly provided some funding uh, to Pakistan in the early 80s when it was developing its nuclear weapons program. And there is at least the idea among sort of intellectual elites who work on these issues that there was a, an unwritten agreement between the countries that, you know, in exchange for this money, should the day come that Saudi needed a nuclear weapon, Pakistan would have their back. Well, I mean, that is exactly what it is. It's an unwritten agreement. And, you know, the moment uh, Faisal calls uh, Pakistan and says, we want one of your nuclear weapons, well, <coughs> look, that wasn't me. That was some, my, my predecessor, and I'm sorry, uh, we can't do that. It's probably what he will hear. So I, I don't put too much credibility on it now. What is it, in your judgment, about the nuclear power program in Iran which is illegal, which justifies sanctions, the power-based program. Nothing. And sanctions are, have not been justified on the basis of the power program. That's so justified on the basis We don't uh, trust you. No. Uh, <laughs> no, let's be careful. It's justified on the basis that Iran did violate its safeguards agreement and operated enrichment facilities in violation of their safeguards agreements, which is a violation by extension of the NPT. Okay, so and therefore did, it was referred... They did violate their they agreement. Did, but did they, or is they, that a question that is unanswered? No, they did. Absolutely, un clearly, unequivocally. Yeah, so. uh, excuse me, why you didn't do the same to Israel when they produced nuclear weapons? So why you made the stage or best? There are two arguments. We're so. bored, right? There, there, there are two arguments to this, two answers, and it goes back to my earlier statement about rationality and values in international politics. The official reason, which is upheld by a legal uh, sort of rationale, is that Israel is not bound by any limitation that would prevent its development of nuclear weapons. It is not a signatory of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's allowed to do whatever it wants. Iran has signed the NPT and has promised to abide by certain uh, behavioral standards that it then violated. So that's the legal reason. Now, now they the, say that uh, the, the previous government si signed it and it was a mistake, so we don't agree with that, so we can do whatever we want. So that's not how treaties work. <laughs> uh, additionally, the, na the nation state is obliged to abide by the treaty regardless of what, who is elected uh, and in power. But uh, even so, they have under Article 10 of the NPT the right to withdraw from the treaty. So if they in fact decided that you know, this was a poor decision on the part of the previous government and we should have the right to do what they want, there is a legal way out. They send a note over to Secretary General of the UN saying, we are withdrawing from the treaty, just like North Korea did. North Korea. So and they didn't do that. You will treat Iran uh, as the same as Israel? I mean, the West and... Uh, in, if they withdrew from the yeah. treaty? So they're going to leave them alone? So or? in the legal rationale, in theory, that's what would happen. Now, we're all adults and know that that's not real, right? So that goes now to the other value. We are... Uh, strong allies with Israel. They have incredible power in uh, influencing domestic politics here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, even so if tough. Israel were a signatory, I would be uh, pretty convinced that we would not see a proportional response. It would be very, very, very different because they are our friend. And Iran became our adversary after the 1979 issue. So this is unquestionably a so matter of, of norms and emotions and, and public opinion and views and rhetoric 
All of these are important. Whether they should be or not, unfortunately, that's a different issue. I'll take the question. Uh, aside from <coughs> violation of NPT, there are many other issues that make concern regarding Iran. And one of those is the under uh, covert actions that they have been doing in many sides, including the third group that they did not say anything about it, and it was revealed by opposition groups. <coughs> and aside from that, the government that does whatever it's doing to its people, government that its leader lie in front of the TV over and over. It's not trustable. So you can like the issue of the trust yeah. comes <laughs> has many, many what facets. Doing in this sense. Sense. So unfortunately that is true of every government in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now you're not talking about any you're talking about Iran and why it's under sanction and Okay, but we don't put Saudi under under <laughs> sanctions. Yeah. And they are uh, in terms of human rights violations and yes, of course, issues, I'm not, I mean, I'm not just pinpointing human rights. Of course, this is very important because, as you know, in 1953, when the CIA coup happened against the Iranian government, it, came, it happened on the national security of the U.S. because of the oil. Shah came to power, and then the uh, Islamic Revolution came to power based on many other many studies, including um, many writers uh, that say that whatever that's there in the Middle East at this point, the roots goes back to that time. Absolutely. For the short uh, term interest of some nations under the notion of national interest for one administration. But if you are looking at the long interest of the US or Iran, the human rights that you mentioned as one word and one of the things that has not been talked, should be really at the top of the agenda because at the end, uh, these things, uh, the Iranian regime needs the money, and they are under pressure. They came to the negotiation table because of the money and sanction. That, that was the only thing that brought them to the uh, <coughs> negotiation table. And it's not that, you know, mostly is affected. Uh, you mentioned the elites are not affected, but the, really the elites are affected by the money. Revolutionary guards, all the elites of that's, the government. That's not clear, actually. I think no, because they are running all the business in Iran. Yeah, but they also have ways around all the sanctions. So it's. No, but at the yeah. end, they need the, you know, the currency. You know, they have. I mean, they, they cannot sell the oil, which is the. And you hear about the, all the corruption news that's happening in Iran. All of the top elites are involved, and then there is no money. But then, I, I think the real dependent. question is how much is you know, the United States in the business of all. Policing, you know, human rights violations in other countries, um, <coughs> where the United States should focus on things that are actually affecting U.S. security, right? So, so I have a question um, uh, related to what you were saying earlier about uh, Russia and China. Um, this is a little bit outside of the actual topic. So, are the Russian? What was Russians' general attitudes towards non-proliferation? Do they consider that to be something of value, preventing proliferation of nuclear weapons, or are they in this business entirely because of the um, other um, interests. Russia has a long history, uh, obviously, going back to the Cold War, of uh, supporting non-proliferation. Mainly, uh, during the Cold War, because of its desire not to complicate, uh, essentially, what was a, a bimodal uh, standoff. What has happened uh, over the last 15 years, I would say, is that that uh, institutional preference for stability in the international regime has slowly been replaced by a kleptocracy, uh, which is driven by Putin and his gang of thugs, uh, to essentially make money as easily uh, as possible using uh, government institutions. Um, a good example of this uh, goes back to uh, 2010 when uh, Russia was asked to consider a, spent f a, a, uh, a program where they would take Iranian LEU, fabricated, uh, Iranian uranium, fabricated into fuel for Boucher, and send it back. And in this way, deal with the stockpile issue, which actually uh, I should put up, because I haven't mentioned why the stockpile is important yet. Um, and, uh, and this would have, if you will, uh, stopped the escalation, because it would have 
prevented Iran from inching closer and closer to a weapons capability by accumulating more and more uh, enriched uranium. And it would provide a certain political relief and sort of confidence building measures that Iran was moving in a direction that was inherently civil versus military and so forth. And the uh, Russian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs said, that sounds interesting. Um, let me check with Rosatom, which is essentially their nuclear export people. And uh, Rosatom came back and said, no way. Uh, this means we will, you know, although we will still be selling them fuel, we will not also be able to build them for the uranium in the fuel. And as a result, reduce profits, forget it. And the Ministry of Foreign well, Affairs, uh, 2010. Okay, and December, and uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which outranks Rosatom, yeah. said, uh, "We changed our mind. This is no longer a good idea." I mean, this is exactly the kind of uh, hierarchy that is in play in Russia. So, but aren't they doing it as part of offering it now again? At Russia offering to do the same thing. They have offered to provide fuel that they fabricate. Under in, in the protocol which is agreed, they will supply fuel for eight reactors for their entire life, their entire life of the reactors. Iran came back and said, we would like to fabricate the fuel in the United States. Russia said, hmm, we will see. And they signed a weaker, not a protocol, but a memorandum of understanding that was, I think was signed yesterday, I, but I have to go back and check, that said, we will investigate the feasibility of this. But that's it. You can be sure about the outcome of that investigation, okay? We're going to go to the gentleman in the back. Uh, I have two questions. One is that if you have the same facilities in Iran, how long do you think does it take for them to make bombs? <coughs> and if it's, that's a possibility? And uh, Because we hear the difference, uh, one year, two year, and you mentioned if they have a covered uh, uh, program, they can do it in 11 days. And uh, the second question, what happened with the... Uh, there was another deal with uh, Turkey and Brazil, and if you have any comments oh, on that. Okay, I, I can talk a little bit about that. All right, so first, this is a good opportunity to <coughs> sort of put up the dynamics for you. So this is a chart I produced uh, in November last year that shows the uh, time to make a nuclear weapon given two parameters. The number of centrifuges IR1 type, the first generation type, versus the amount of uranium that they've enriched to 3.5% here. So it's a 3.5% is <coughs> what you start with? 3.5% is what the plant, the big plant, underground at Natanz produces as a product. And so that's the enriched uranium that can be used as reactive fuel. And so yes, if you start with this, which is already, in the, in the world of enrichment, uh, this contains approximately 70% of the work required to make bomb grid material. So this, this stockpile represents a lot of work already done, and they're making use of that by starting with 3.5% instead of regular, what we call natural uranium. So a couple of uh, things are interesting. One is that you can just pick, pick what you want your breakout time to be. Obama has said publicly that he will not accept a deal that for which the breakout time is under one year, 12 months. Uh, however, you know, he did not specify how one does the calculus, and, I, and so I think that's just a, a kind of a meaningless statement. Um, but you can say, well, look, I'm comfortable with four-month deal, and then you can say, well, if Iran insists on having 10,000 centrifuges, then they have to reduce their stockpile to something like 475 kilograms. And so this is how you can uh, work out a deal given an objective uh, of what you want to achieve. Now, uh, an important fact here is that this chart begins to go flat over here in this region. And what that means is there is a, there is a point at which the amount of uranium in your country that you accumulate as you're just running your centrifuges doesn't matter. It doesn't change the breakout time. You just keep collecting more and more uranium. This line is flat forever. And so a really stable outcome would be a deal that doesn't uh, implement any restraint on uranium that allows Iran to run its program without any kind of requirement that it exports uranium every month or so on, some kind of complication. 
And just by the virtue of the number of centrifuges, you achieve the breakout time that you want. And that's what I call the clean deal. It's stable. But Iran uh, and Zarif and does not want this deal. They, they want a deal that has a large number of centrifuges. And therefore, in order to achieve any reasonable value within this range, you have to constrain the uranium stockpile to some low number. How much 20% uh, LEU do they have? It's in the hundreds of kilograms range. I, I think they plan to convert 125 kilograms, but I have yeah, to go Something that. like that. Oh, sorry, that's 20%. No. Yeah, uh, 20%. How much do they have in, in, in yeah. three and a half? For their research reactor. Well, it's not used, none. The research reactor doesn't use three and a half percent. No. It uses 20%. 20%. Yeah. How much do they have of that? Hundreds of kilograms. <coughs> Well, then you should show the short for that. So you can convert, you can convert into three and a half percent. I think that's what we would we would propose. You, I mean, I can't pre present a three. I could present a four dimensional chart. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you could see in four dimensions, unfortunately, it's complicated. Well, the way someone like me simplifies that is just to say, look, you convert the twenty percent to three and a half percent by down blending it, and this this is then the chart you're on, and that's an easy thing they can agree to. Uh, so, Very short time. Un unfortunately, um, because of this claim that they need to save face and have large number of machines, we're in this range where we now need some very complicated arrangement where we verify on a monthly basis that they haven't accumulated too much of a U and then they export it and they never miss a shipment and they do this for 12 years. I mean, this is a very, it I just see this as stupid because it keeps the tension up. It keeps the focus on the nuclear program. It makes it difficult to start talking about these other issues that we need to talk about. It maintains Iran in the threat category as opposed to moving beyond that. And uh, I, I think that Iran is shooting itself in the foot with this. And they really should come into this domain. But so far, they have not agreed to do that. And this timeline is related to achieving the nuclear bomb? This timeline is the time required to produce 25 kilograms of HU which is approximately the amount that they would need for their first generation implosion type nuclear bomb. Now after you produce that material, you also have to make the bomb, and the IAEA estimates that would take one to three weeks. What they say is that we presume that all the processes involved in making the bomb have been practiced using surrogate material, that all the facilities exist, and they're small, their bench top things are fit in this room, there's nothing that you can't hide. And what about dirty bombs that doesn't need those? Completely a different category. Dirty but bombs is not related to this at all. You had a question, sir? Oh, oh wait, I'm sorry, important. This, so he was talking about what was called the tri... Uh, I forget what it was called, trilateral TDD. Um, it was essentially an agreement back in 2010, 2011. Between Brazil, uh, Turkey, and Iran, to uh, for Iran to place certain constraints on its nuclear program and uh, open up serious discussions. Um, what happened was it was essentially dismissed out of hand immediately and never seriously considered by the U.S. Uh, the U.S. issued a statement. Uh, 15 or so points about everything that was wrong with this deal. It is my personal opinion that there was only one real problem with the deal, and that is uh, Iran said, well, we will export our uranium, but we retain the right to bring it back on a moment's notice for whatever reason we decide. So it's not really exported. It's just, I mean, it, it, it didn't stop them from using it. And they had to have given that up. But if they had given that up, I think it was a good deal. And, and it should have provided a basis. But you have to look at it in the context of what was happening. One, uh, Obama was still in his first term and was not going to take a lot of risk. Two, uh, Jalili, the negotiator, and Ahmadinejad were not exactly your uh, most reliable negotiators, and even though this was being done, it wasn't clear why it was being done. It was being done just to embarrass the U.S. Were they really serious? We just, we didn't know. 
Uh, three, it wasn't clear that there was actually widespread buy-in within the Iranian government. Uh, it wasn't shopped around with the Majlis. It wasn't, didn't go to Supreme National Security Council. It didn't go to the Supreme Leader's office. It was just something that the, foreign min uh, that the president decided to do, and whether this would actually be upheld within the Iranian political system was deeply in question. And four, most importantly, this was done on the eve of the U.S. passing, I think, US, UN Resolution 1929, which was the new sanctions resolution. The U.S. was literally, day by day, counting votes on what I call the non-permanent members, the E10 of the Security Council, to get this resolution. And on no uncertain terms were they going to derail what, at that point, was a nine-month effort to pass this resolution because of what they saw was a gimmick uh, by Iran. So it was just the wrong time, basically. Shayla, you have a question? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to go back to what you said earlier, because uh, it was brought up, you said that the US and Iran, that, uh, have the, that Iran has been an enemy of ours since the, the issue with the, the uh, since 78 or well, nine. I say, I, this but, enmity, I don't know if we can really with say With the that embassy. Enmity. But <laughs> but I think for Iran, it probably goes back to um, Mossadegh. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they've had a uh, fear of us for a lot longer and a, and a hostile feelings. But And then the other thing I wanted to say is that I think that with um, Zarif and Rouhani, we have a very different... Um, negotiating partner, we have a different Iran in many ways, and as you say, changing so rapidly in terms of technology. So don't you think that all those things need to be taken into consideration more than our sort of cloud of suspicion about, about Iran? I mean, they are being taken into consideration. That's why we are here. Okay. And that's why there is Monday to talk about. Okay. Um, do you have, by any chance, any intelligence in relation to Obama's letters to the Supreme Leader? I have no idea what they said. <laughs> I heard that the Supreme Leader responded. That's it. Um, we're going to go to Aaron Bernstein. And um, then come so I, I agree that I've thought all along that what motivating Iran is, is the uh, idea of having a virtual weapon. I think for all the political, uh, military ramifications and what it means. But it cuts two ways. Um, and also, I also agree with the other statement you made that if Iran were going to make a bomb, they, they would do it surreptitiously or pull out. Uh, actually, they wouldn't pull out of, of, of the NPT because that would be a signal. So they would just do it surreptitiously. Uh, but see, this cuts two ways. When, you, when we think about the politics, and I'm, I'm really thinking about American politics primarily and, and the battle. Uh, uh, you know, our administration has very, very few parameters to you know, thread this needle. And, and uh, the enemies of any agreement also have this in mind. So, so it just, it's, it's really a comment, but I think it just cuts two ways. This is a very political, it's going to come down to a very political thing, not a technical thing. Uh, but I think you're right that the breakout time, it's, 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 it's an argument that's going to be used, but it's, it's and, and it, the numbers that get agreed to somehow are going to have to reflect that. But, 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 uh, the real issue is, is those people who don't want any agreement at all, and you've articulated some of the reasons. And, and uh, well, there are tremendous advantages. I think the people, those of us who want an agreement, uh, we're going to have a political fight on our hand. And we have to talk about the advantages and the fact that there's no risk-free world. Okay, so whatever you do, there are risks and downsides. I mean, there's, in my view, more downsides to not having the agreement. But there are risks with an agreement. There's no question. 
So we're going to take his question and then yours, right? Uh, the question is, I know, anticipate that you were still pensile for anything like that, but mm -hmm. <laughs> if there was an agreement, a comprehensive agreement on all the issues, the whole spectrum, what would the, how would the dynamics in the Middle East, the conflicts, just as a kind of a, yeah, a wand and you could take us there. <laughs> Did I mention I'm an engineer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I think it, it, it depends mostly on what happens after the agreement. It's my personal view. And I, I really need to say here that I'm not an expert on the politics. But I, I think it depends on whether we drop the ball after the agreement. And the Iran nuclear issue is allowed to fester and be seen as unfinished business in a way that the Iraqi program was after the first Gulf War. Or if we have the fortitude to move beyond that and actually start discussing the huge agenda of issues that the, that the Middle East uh, needs to have discussed. And if that happens, the nuclear issue, will, I hope, will just disappear. And then this will become the, the entree. Well, it will fade. It will fade. And, I, and this will become the entree to a, a bigger political process. Um, but that depends uh, you know, on so many factors that I have no idea how to evaluate. Well, you did allude to it before, the whole idea of, of being able to do things with Iran that we can't do right now. We can't at least openly uh, talk about their what's going on in Syria with Iran or ISIS. And, uh, yeah. and but, you yeah, said, the question is whether you know our State Department and the domestic political situation will allow us to do that, and you know, or whether we're going to be so fatigued that we just say forget it. Uh, I want to go to Gordon. Um, <clears throat> what you just discussed is a scenario or a set of scenarios that would follow a successful agreement. Um, Aaron, in the discussion just prior, talked about risks and benefits, and that gets to the question of scenarios if there is not an agreement, and also scenarios if Iran is attacked. And I'm wondering if uh, any entity in the US government has systematically played out these scenarios and evaluated their risks and benefits? Or has anyone outside government done a good job of that? Um, well, one hopes that the government has done that. Uh, but those, those kinds of studies are not, if they were done or not, um, will be very tightly held. <coughs> Certainly, there are entities outside the government, uh, but in all of these things, it depends on, you know, you're predicting the future. And it depends on what factors you consider to be important and influential, and you have to kind of predict what uh, the minds of the leader and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I really hesitate to get into the predict the future business uh, on the consequences of no deal. You know, it could it could just continue. Um, you know, we, Iran turns on its centrifuges, it stays a couple months from the bomb, uh, and that's it, because it really doesn't see any value to escalating further. But um, it's, it's difficult to could, predict the future. No one yeah. can, can predict the future. But the reason you do scenario analysis, which is become a very tool, <coughs> is to get some grasp of the, the potentials and what they mean. And just to assume status quo um, and forget and throw up hands about the rest is actually to assign maximum probability to the status quo as a it, scenario. It's a probably that's, a Markov that's no more process. rational. Well, that's the Markov yeah. process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's actually probably the most <laughs> rational thing is to assume status quo. To assume that the status quo will change uh, requires that there has to be some fluctuation that drives change. And it's, since you can't identify which direction that change will be driven, it's very hard. Uh, 
We're going to take your question. Well, what advice would you give Iran if this were just strictly a commercial venture that they want to build nuclear reactors to produce electricity? There's but, plenty of other countries in the world in the world that produce nuclear. I would say uh, do what what every other country does. Buy lots of reactors, get yourself multiple fuel supply contracts, and uh, give up anything that's politically or even economically expensive and is not necessary for the program. So do other countries produce their own fuel, or do they buy fuel in the market? Everyone buys fuel. Almost the number of countries that produce their own fuel is very, they are basically those countries that make nuclear reactors. So then they could buy the nine reactors from the Russians, buy the supply on the marketplace, and they'd have clean fuel. Yeah, to that's why this is exactly this so is this, so it's yeah this is so why are we spending so much time with a country that says they're producing it for peaceful means for electricity when no one else is going through this process that's buying reactors and buying reactors from the Russians and from other countries but this is the most complicated commercial venture anyone has ever seen. This is why no one believes that it's purely <laughs> a commercial issue. <laughs> 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 so. Probably, the public, the public in Iran probably believe that it is this for these programs and those other things. But I, I personally have no doubt that smart folks inside Iran, right, basically, and uh, they do they do think of this as a basically breakout of potential capacity, and for good reasons, by the way. You know, like if you uh, look at the history of Iranian nuclear activities, you know, uh, it was kind of reaccelerated during the Iran Iraq War, and uh, because uh, I mean. Oh, should I mention that it was kind of stopped at first in 1979 for, for, for a little period. And because Khomeini, the leader, basically thought this is something American, you know, like endorse. So they said, oh, we don't, want, we don't need this. Near the end of Iran Iraq war, when Iran was attacked uh, with chemical weapons, by the way, by, 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 by Iraq, and they had nothing to defend themselves. Basically, they said, okay, what if Saddam goes one step further and develops a nuclear weapon? What are we going to do? So that was the time that they started basically again uh, uh, working on this. So, mm -hmm. and if you think about the Middle East, I mean, it's to be real, it's, uh, uh, then, then the, there are people who think that Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, you know, like, okay, they are now a friendly neighbor, they, become, they could become hostile in 10, 15 years uh, when the country is breaking apart into a belief. So, uh, if you are in uh, Iran, and if, if you are basically entering modernity and all those things that we talked about, if, if, if it is kind of stupid, if, if, if you don't have a, a, a security uh, basic doctrine or framework. That's why I think, in the end, as you said, this is basically comes down to a political issue. Iran will always have the capacity to, uh, to produce nuclear weapons, three months, four months, ten months. And as we go forward, this is going to, you know, in 12 years, things are going to change. So it's just a matter of making the decision to make, to make, to make a nuclear bomb. That's why, I guess, all the rational people in Iran and the U.S., uh, uh, they want this agreement to provide you know, the political platform to prevent that from happening because I think, again, the smart folks inside Iran, they don't think developing a nuclear weapon is a smart thing to do right now. Basically, they want engagement with the U.S., and, but I guess they want to have the capacity if things, you know. Uh, so I, so I, you know, I agree with, with everything you said, uh, and, and you didn't necessarily endorse that line of thinking, but but you said this is active, and I agree with that. The issue, the issue I think, that Iran and the rest, rest of the Middle East, frankly, needs to face is whether this anarchic, to use a political science term, international system in which every country looks out for their own interests and they believe, and it is at some level a belief, that possession of nuclear weapons will lead to stability. And I think that needs to be seriously reevaluated, because the consequences of accidental escalation, misuse, theft, terrorism, etc., with nuclear weapons is very serious, and is not a form of security. And so they have to decide whether exactly how close they want to get, and whether they feel safer with a Middle East where every one of their uh, adversaries, and there's a lot of them in the Middle East, also have that capability. Or whether they feel safer with everyone basically not having that capability. And this is also now a very poignant question for Israel too. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately Israel has, uh, since the 
you know, 60s now, uh, you know, 50, some 55 years, uh, something like this, of institutionalized thinking around the virtues of their nuclear weapons program. And now they are facing a very different world that didn't exist for the last 50 years, where their neighbors could potentially meet them in that nuclear capability. And now the value of those nuclear weapons comes into question. But whether, I mean, this is a generational issue. People in Israel have grown up educated and thinking about nuclear weapons in one way, and now the world is different. And so, you know, these are very difficult questions that will probably take generations to unwind. And also, I'd like to add some comments in this regard, that especially considering the Iranian regime, the nature of undemocratic regime, what he's doing to his people, and the threats that he's issuing, you know, uh, blackmailing, so having such a power uh, is something very special about this country. That, you know, Unfortunately, they would say the same thing about Israel, right? They say, look, here is a country for which in almost the majority of the population is uh, now Arab. Uh, it is a, it's becoming an apartheid state. They uh, put people in concentration regions in the, uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They uh, treat them like second-class citizens or non-citizens. They, I mean, all of these arguments are also levied against our allies. No, but you know, I and completely so, agree with everything that you said regarding yeah. Israel in this context. But in Iran, is different. Israel has a Jewish uh, you know, population, and their Arab population, and they are dealing with that Arab population that, we, that the way that you said, and worse than that, and I agree with everything. But I'm talking about the Iran, the uh, freedom of expression, that you, know, you see what's happening in the newspaper, and yeah. so on. And that's going on to the whole population. Yeah? It's, it's true, the story is different. Saudi is much worse than Iran. I mean, uh, in terms of all of those issues that you Yes, have. but you know, right now we are not talking about the Saudi Arabia and nuclear issues and having the power and the rest uh, of I'm not sure. They have enormous power. No, I'm talking Saudi about basically it. has uh, the oil weapon. No, I'm talking Far about more useful. <laughs> yeah, and also Iran has the oil weapon too, or hide it. I'm talking in the context of having the nuclear weapon or threats yeah, I'm, of I'm not sure weapon. that they're related though. I mean, uh, you know, what, what a cultural, uh, you know, Iran, yes, Iran is valid faqi. It is a theocracy that is unparalleled in the world. It, it has a certain religious orient and, and brings with it a whole history of cultural norms uh, that are part of its uh, religious tradition. And this is very misaligned with Western uh, ethical and moral thinking. And, uh, it's very easy to sit there and you know accuse them, but I would not say any of that uh, really is in operation when it comes to the nuclear program. You have to remember that the clerical class in in Iran is the most forceful uh, advocate of not acquiring nuclear weapons. The revolutionaries are not even really in support of nuclear weapons. It's really the class. Uh, the generation of people who are more or less secular, even though they portray themselves as being religious, and grew up during the Iraq-Iran War, and had their views formed under what we would consider in the U.S. to be conventional, traditional, real politics, you know, Western-type political thinking, not theocratic. I, I agree with you so, that this kind of advertisement came out, but in the recent <coughs> demonstrations, there have been some uh, slogans that against that, for example, at that time they said that nuclear power is our rights. And in a recent demonstration, there are slogans that is, says many other things are our power, the economy, freedom, and so on. So I don't believe that you know this is something that is based on the new generation and so on. This is something that even the Ahmadinejad regime of power advertised a lot. But um, Ahmadinejad did not, I mean, he was such a, he made the situation worse, but he didn't start it, he didn't put the program into play, and frankly, he didn't have a lot of power. He was kind of this bad hair day for Iran. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't think you can take all of his anti-Israel, Israeli rhetoric and, and infuse it with meaning. I just, you know.
do we have any further questions or comments about the topic today? Go ahead. Comment about your point actually. One thing it's good to keep in mind is the story of the nuclear program in Europe. So it started before the revolution by US, and the US was basically selling its technology to Europe. And right after the revolution, clearly it stopped because of the escalation between the governments. And then after that, as the guy there mentioned, after toward the end of the war, it again Iran started to building those. And then Iran went to Chinese and said, let's come and build this for us. But then Chinese were taken out of the program by US pressure. And then Iran started building by their own, and then going to Pakistan and people in their own neighboring countries. So the thing about there is, there is a very good write-up by Human Match in Guardian just two days ago or yesterday. He talks about the perspective of the dignity of the Iranians. And he says that if there is a deal to be accepted by Iranians, their dignity should be appreciated. So they want to be proud that they have done something. That's the story behind it. No, no, I, I, yeah. So that's why the, the <coughs> Iranians are not about going to buy the deal. They want to create it by their own. Because they once tried it about, I think, three or two years ago, that they wanted to actually fuel for the research reactor in Tehran. But nobody saw it. So they want that. They want to have that security. It's, we should look at that security from both sides. Yes, the West and the Europeans are worried about Iran building the nuclear weapon, and Iran is worried they don't sell it. Because they yeah, unfortunately, it unfortunately, though, as I outlined in my talk, nothing that they want would actually provide them with that security. 10,000 right. centrifuges doesn't get them that, uh, you know, not having the knowledge and capability to fabricate commercial PWR fuel, which is a non-trivial thing, doesn't get them that. This is a fig leaf of security. This is not real. They haven't asked for anything real. And there are ways of getting that security that do not exacerbate the proliferation concern, and they're not interested in it. So it's, it is about their dignity, but it is not about secure, fuel supply security. I just wanted to ask you one thing. First of all, thank you so much for doing this. It's so helpful. But um, one, the one thing that I think I wanted to ask you again is, isn't the inspection, uh, isn't the ability to um, monitor what's going on very valuable, The I, having the IAEA available? I, I liked your idea of a more stable situation, but in that, that seems to me to be a plus that maybe needs to be emphasized a little more. But then I think that it's not only just to be proud that Iran wants, but I think they do want respect. I think that that is what they have lacked, is respect from the West, and particularly from the U.S., and that they need that. Yes. And Ahmadinejad may not have cared so much about that, he, but uh, I think that Rouhani and, and Zarif do. So we're going to take one more comment from Gordon. Do the Iranians talk about the Japanese plutonium program? They always bring it up. <laughs> and uh, related to that, um, would it be helpful to the Iran negotiations if uh, Japan mothballed the Rakasha? If they mothball the Rakasha? Mothballed the Rakasha. I don't think so, because. Uh, I mean, there's a, there'd be a lot of support in the non-proliferation community for mothballing Rakasha, don't get me wrong, but I just, I don't think it would change a thing. Japan is an opportunistic rhetorical device. The moment it disappears as a rhetorical device, it doesn't change Iran's <coughs> inherent structure. They don't suddenly go, oh, now Japan is giving up this capability, we should too. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, this is it's a, just I'm, a rhetorical device. I'm thinking of, since we put dignity on the table, about face well, but Iran has already agreed not to reprocess. So, if Iran gave up, if Japan gave up its enrichment program, maybe that would be more significant. Um, so, on that note, I would like to thank you all for coming, and we want to thank our We also, before everybody just heads out, we have a sign up sheet. If you've, been, if you've enjoyed today's discussion and would like to participate more in our events, please give me your email and I'll, I'll add you to our mailing list. Thank you again for coming. And I please take food, food. but there's a lot of it. I, I think I will come here. So yes, fabulous. Thank you so much. much. I, love, I love your sense of humor. <laughs> oh, oh, please, though. So. Thank you. I, I don't know. Uh, your prayer will help. Maybe your prayer will help. <laughs> <laughs> For the success of that.
Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. Motto Hall, I'm retired by From what department? Here. Here? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Otto was the former director of the reactor. Go look up the uh, alumni list. I should look up the newcomer list. <laughs> Is there any conceivable deal where it would be in Israel? Iran's and the United States' interest to do away with the weapons program in Israel and uh, yes, yeah, such a deal would, abs in my view, would absolutely be great. Uh, really take much like medically like, 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 No worries. Thank you for coming. Hold on, let me look up so I can see who I'm talking to. Did anybody think about? Here you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate saying that. So sorry. I shouldn't have had chairs. I didn't want to get any more chairs. It was actually a good one. It's good. It's just good. It's 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 good.